Do I have a treat for you today, people of Facebook? Okay, right now all you're seeing is a picture of uh, my uh, back garden. No pun, nothing, no innuendo, nothing like that. However, I have something for you to look at today. Uh, we love showing you the process of things. And today, guess what we have here? Hello, Mark. Hello. What are you doing? What I'm doing is, the painting is now finished, but I'm sealing it with a liquid glaze. Oh. So this will protect all the layers of the underpainting, and it will also um, evenly coat it with a, a sheen. Because when you paint, you get some matte sections, uh, and you get some uh, highlighted varnish sections. So this will evenly coat it. Sorry, you are all in my manky kitchen that desperately needs decorating, but that is not the important part. The important part is we have this amazing poster that's being finished in my kitchen. Look at that. So there's three different types of painting process in this painting. So the top layer, the sky, is very loosely painted with a lot of varnish. So the linseed oil and the liquid does a lot of the work. I use uh, an ordinary um, wall paint brush, uh, a three inch brush, just to help merge it in. The this, this middle section is a lot more detailed, so that's finer brush painting. And then the bottom section is a looser application of the paint. So a bigger brush, more loose. So your focus point is driven to the center where this scenario has taken place. And then the, the supporting themes of derelict, the sunset, monochromatic, the whore, the hands, they play second part, but it all merges in. Your eye follows the arm, the fingertips, the two characters, back into the building, a specific location for the movie, and then back down again. So your eyes keep moving around the scene. So while Mark does all this, if you have any questions for him, go for it and I will ask them as you pose them. Um, this is your chance here to ask questions to someone who's immensely talented and has some incredible skills. I mean, look at this, you know. I, how long did that take to, to, to paint? So it took about eight days to complete but when you work with oils it's uh, this is an indirect process so a direct process is where you paint the the light and the shadow at the same time but how i work with this is you paint the details first so you paint the sky because the background you paint the building you paint the characters you paint the hands and then over the next few days you start applying semi-transparent glazes and these will build up layers and layers of shade. And what happens eventually is it pushes the background away and brings the objects into the foreground forward. So about eight days and 30% of that time is waiting for the layers to dry. Amazing, amazing. So this is, this is essentially the canvas for our derelict crowdfunding campaign. So it's a derelict poster. This will be one of our two posters. Uh, once we've added the, added the title, first we have to get it photographed, uh, but then we had titles, we had credit blocks, we had credits on the top, and this is, this is a poster, you know. And this canvas is actually for sale on our derelict crowdfunding campaign. So you can actually have this actual painting in your house. Not a copy, not a photo, this painting, this one in front of me right there. And while Mark is, is putting those final touches on it, uh, it, what is it you're putting on, Mark? So I'm putting on liquid. So liquid is a glaze medium, but it also speeds up the drying process. So what liquid does is it um, seals the entire surface of the canvas and evenly coats it, um, like I said earlier, with a sheen. Because what happens is you get matte sections, glossy sections, and if it's in your... In your home and the sun comes against you know shines against it you'd notice those blotches so this is almost like a sheet of glass so mike is saying you are amazing thank you mike so while uh, while mark puts the uh, the liquid on you this is your chance to ask questions guys so you know any questions that you have about this process 
this is the moment. Let's look at some details. Look at that, it's getting a bit blurry, but yeah. The Jack Farrell says the color palette and contrasts are amazing. Thank you, Jack. Oh, you recognize our friend Mike Coombs on there and our, our actress uh, Suzanne. So a sense of scale. So Mike's head next to my thumb. So this is obviously, so the, the painting is 600 millimeter wide by 900 millimeter high. So it's quite a large canvas and it does have some very intricate sections of paintwork. Pay no mind to my horrible kitchen, please, but look at this. Yeah, so this is, this is actually one of the perks on our crowdfunding campaign. And obviously, um, the interesting thing is that if anyone picks it up, it will go directly to, it will go directly to Mark. So he will get paid for his work. And it's amazing work, uh, as you can see. It's kind of moving seeing it being finished in my house. Um, there's something very moving about that. It's got a very nice smell as well. It reminds me of my dad's workshop. So oils are beautiful. Yeah, they, they have they have resonance and they have uh, there's a certain ambience, a certain um, they they react to the light. So you never, as a rule, you would never really. Um, hang an oil painting face in a window because the light will reflect against the canvas and the shine will take away the detail. So you'd usually um, hang it, uh, canvas there, light source from the side. And that lets the natural light in the room then take over and it actually brings up the section. So on a, on a nice afternoon day, no artificial lights on, this sky will become, it'll light up, it'll become alive. And then the dark areas will blend into the atmosphere of the room. And that's why oils are so magical. I mean, the thing for me is it was, I always loved painted movie posters. I always loved them. I thought they were always, uh, you know, they were always stunning. And that doesn't take away from, from other posters. I think, for example, Mike did an amazing job on the, on our, on our other poster. It's, it's great. Um, but I always loved a, a painted movie poster. I, I think it, it's, Mark Stewart, what are your inspirations and influences on this poster and just you work, your workflow in general? So, um, so, the, so the, the original influence for this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I love Renaissance work. I love the work of Caravaggio, uh, Rembrandt, uh, Rembrandt was later obviously, but Caravaggio, I love um, dramatic uh, lighting sources. So this is, this is quite uh, Renaissance type because it's got a lot of ochres and bronze. But when I met Jonathan originally to discuss concept work for Derelict and his idea for this poster, um, Edward Hopper, um, film noir, dramatic light source, that was the main influence for this. So then after we decided on the composition of the, the painting for the, the movie poster, we determined how much information we want to give away. You know, you, you use pieces, you use objects, characters, environment, lighting, um, colour even, you know, the, the sunset's a big, the, the skyline is a big part of the derelict storyline. It's, it's, it's a visually dramatic influence on how Jonathan plans to tell the story. But you also have black and white, you have your monochromatic areas. So you, you use all these different factors to represent the movie in one poster but you don't want to give the story away. So this scene may not appear, you know, or it won't in the movie, but you use, you're, you're telling a narrative from these. So, so yes, my main influence is, I love Renaissance work. Um, uh, for this specifically, it was Edward Hopper uh, from Noir. It's, uh, it's very traditionally painted. So it, it does go back to the, the early 1400 style where you, you built up a layer process on canvas and you didn't paint directly, you painted a piece, you went away, you had a cup of tea, you come back a day later, you apply a, a dark glaze, you've got some branches here, you go, I want them to stand out, you get a rag, and you literally rub the semi-transparent darker glaze away, and that reveals the underlay of highlights. So you, you paint, you actually paint the environment first, then you hammer it with dark glazes, you paint all over it, basically. And so that's what gives it its, its depth. 
So you're building layers. Building layers. There's about there is there are about um, ten layers in this. So you you paint the building, then you paint the foliage, then you paint a few shades on it. Then you scratch out the mortar between the bricks. Then you come back and you paint it up. You come in the next day and you go, that's not dark enough. You paint over it again and you end up bombarding it with, um, like I said, about 10 layers in here. And that's why it tricks your eye, because some areas are so dark, some are so pronounced, but they still had to remain silhouetted in the shape. You know, I didn't want to paint uh, just a black patch. I wanted that when you when you took the time to look at the detail, you've seen the layers coming through and that's why the oil comes to life. For those who just uh, joined us on this live, so we are looking at our poster for Derelict. Uh, this is the original canvas, so then it has to be photographed. We have to add titles, names, uh, credit blocks, or logos, all that stuff. So that's all going to go on there. But essentially, this is the original canvas painted by Mark Stewart. He's finishing it in my kitchen, uh, which desperately needs decorating. Maybe I'll decorate the kitchen after, after <laughs> it's done. Um, but essentially, this canvas here is available as a perk on our crowdfunding. Not a copy, not a poster this canvas you can have that in your house if you know anyone who has this type of money this is this is a piece of art i was always always fascinated with painted posters i always wanted one i've had two now from mark two that were absolutely amazing i mean look at this this is this is stunning and it tells so much about the story as well it tells so much about the story and this is what i love uh, about it how much is it says jack Jack, it is uh, three thousand pounds to get that canvas in your house. The original, not a copy. There is only one. This is a single opportunity. There is not two. There is not three. There is one, and it is signed by Mark. And you also, if you spend that kind of money, you also get all sorts of other perks. Um, I believe, like uh, in invited a premiere, a Blu-ray, a T-shirt, this sort of thing. So. And this is the, I mean, this is, this is amazing. Look at this. So what we do now is we're going to check the light source. We're going to make sure it's evenly applied. So you can see the glaze come up now against, well, you might see it on the live feed. Oh, you do. Yeah, you actually do. But what it does, it will, sh it will show me where it, I just may have missed a section. So it's really important to get an even coat. And when it dries, does it make it a bit shinier? It actually will lose, it will, um, the gloss will go down again, it will calm down. It just makes sure that it's an even coat. But yeah, a liquid's very kind. It won't, it's not a, a high resonance varnish. It actually calms down quite a lot. Um, I think, you know, it's time for another announcement. And that you might be interested in, Jack, as well is that uh, in the next few days, I believe we are set to add a new perk to our crowdfunding. And this perk will be, I don't know exactly the cost, but if you purchase it, Mark will actually draw a portrait of you in the style of his derelict art. So that will be a thing coming soon. Um, and we, we hope that people, you know, buy into that. What was really important for us for this campaign we see, we do see a lot of crowdfunding campaigns, some very successful, and uh, I have no problem with any of them. But we really wanted to value the art and the the, the artist, um, and and get something around. That's a very arty movie, and we wanted, we didn't want to lie about that, and we wanted to go straight into into this idea that this crowdfunding campaign is to support art. So. I hope you're enjoying uh, looking at the process. It would have been awesome to be able to record Mark a little bit every day doing the painting, but obviously that that comes with its own set of challenges. I have a lot of photographs from the very initial. The whole you, process. Which Jonathan hasn't seen, so I can forward them to Jonathan. So you might have a timeline of about 10, 12. Pictures. Nice. Any more questions? Come on, this is your chance. You know, How often do you get to talk to someone who can paint like that? And so if you just got on this feed, Mark is applying 
the liquid to the painting this is why shining his phone on it it shows him if there's any bits that uh, are missing so that it's applied evenly throughout the whole painting and then after that we add the titles and the credit blocks and we make it into an actual film poster yes so they so obviously the design and the layout, the composition of the poster is important aesthetically, but when I talk to Jonathan, he's very specific about what he wants for the poster, so you have to design the poster as well to take into account where he wants to put the title card, how large it wants to be, where he wants to put the credit block. So you, you design uh, the light and shade again to give him the opportunity. So this the bottom section is darker, so you could have a, a light font credit block on the bottom and it won't go any higher than this. And then Jonathan was quite specific. The, the sky, the sunset is a, is a big feature in Derlich. So let's use that. Let's enhance it. Let it overwhelm the painting. But also it's a, got a practicality because it gives him the opportunity to put his title and cast credits in the actual area. So there's, so there's a lot of... A lot of work goes into creating this. Uh, it's not just the the, um, the during process, it's the beforehand. Um, Mike kindly sent me some pictures of himself, which were brilliant, and his stance just worked out perfect because he's quite unsure. He's got one leg slightly out of line, so it's not a solid stance. So he looks a little bit vulnerable in this scene. Um, Mike sent it to me, so it was, it, his pictures were great, so all I had to do was make sure I give him a slight worm's eye perspective view, because you've got a horizon line, so you can't look down on someone, you have to be down on the ground with the hands looking up. So this was perfect, because it's got the correct angle. If you were looking at it, the arch would go down at that angle. This, this you know, is the same level of building, but it's tilted like that, because of the worm's eye perspective. And it's the same here. You have to respect that because if you don't, it will look completely different. Yeah. And Suzanne, um, I had a lot of reference pictures of her, and um, pretty much did that one out of my head. You know, you know, I seen photographs of her in Jonathan's post, so I understood, um, you know, the her height. I think she's five seven. It says in the stats. Mike's quite a tall guy, so make sure I wanted them quite even, but make sure it obeys the laws of height and proportion. I'm going to zoom in on the details a bit. For those who just started watching, this is our, uh, the, the original canvas for the, the poster of our film, Derelict, which is currently crowdfunding. This very canvas is actually a perk on our crowdfunding campaign. So, um, although this, I'm, I keep repeating this, it's probably boring for people who've been uh, watching all along, but I see new people coming in. So, this is actually a perk you can have this very canvas in your house um, and the money will go to Mark who is right here finishing it in my monkey kitchen yes indeed Jack we are lucky I'm gonna go in on the hands for you my friend because you said you wanted to look at the detail I don't know how well that looks on the on the fur on the phone it's gonna be a bit flat obviously it's spectacular in person uh, I'm going to zoom in on Mike because I'm sure he'll like that. Look at this. And there we go. If you have questions, now's your time. This is your chance to ask a painter anything you've ne you've always wanted to ask and we're always afraid to. This is your time. There's no stupid questions. So you guys go for it. It is you, Mike. Look at that. You have a painting Tiny Mike. of you. How amazing is that? So just for those who just joined us, Mark, uh, Mark is shining his phone light on the painting to make sure that he's, he's, he's applied the liquid to every, every single bit of it to finish it. Don't want to get your furniture, John. I wouldn't worry about that. Now I'll just wipe the edge of the canvas in case there's any excess glaze on it. Apologies for the monkey kitchen, but this is essentially the unveiling of our poster, 
the image finished and then we send it to a photographer to take very very high quality picture you'd, you'd prefer to scan it but it's very complicated to scan especially because you need specialist equipment and so on so we get it photographed um, keep as much detail as possible in it get that color popping it'd be nice to get a few um, detailed shots as well because that in itself is quite look at the detail on this I mean, Mike, yeah, we can recognize you. But had to, I, I did explain to Jonathan during the week when I was sharing pictures of the process. It was important not to go super detailed because then it tricks your eyes for focus. So if this is too focused, this wouldn't be focused. And if you have high definition focus, high definition focus, it throws off. It does, it does feel like the sunset light is genuine because that's the way that your eyes would, would see the, the, the light and the, the shadows and the detail in, in those light conditions. When starting a painting like this, where do you even start and how do you go about deciding what tools and color palette? Right, excellent question. So, um, the sunset was a big theme of the, the actual... Uh, the painting based on the you know the screenplay and the narrative of derelict so ochres orange yellow vibrancy in the sky was critical so once you determine what sky you're going to use then everything must obey the color scheme on that so there's a certain uh, burnt umber uh, ochre color that comes across everything because in that environment these colors the sky would affect the colour and the atmosphere on everything. So, um, and the, the actual process, oils, it was always going to be oils because I painted in oils uh, the Wyvern Hill poster. Uh, oils gives you look, brilliant freedom, but it's, it's a kinder, I find it a kinder medium to use than acrylic or watercolour because with watercolour you have to build it up in layer and layer and layer, a lot more than this, just to get the certain depth and definition that you need. So it was always going to be oils, it was always going to be on canvas, um, and uh, I think that's really it. So I, I have a question actually uh, relating to that. So you did the designs uh, digitally? I did the designs digitally. So why did you decide to do a painting for the poster? Because, well, it's, it's a story of passion really, and I said this to Jonathan. I was originally going to produce a digital image, and it would have been original, it would have been created in Adobe Fresco, so it would be all hand-drawn, I don't do any of that tracing rubbish, as there, there are time lapses for the concepts, and you can actually see the entire process, so I don't cheat. I, I, I think that just uh, degrades everything. So, I said to Jonathan that because of the Weibel Hill poster, how it influenced people, how people, it, you know, respected it so much, I thought, it had to be an oil. Plus, if you are um, if you're using something as a perk, the uniqueness and authenticity of a, of an original oil painting is it's one. It's one of a kind. It's got a lot more um, significance um, than uh, something that can be reproduced. So that is why I went for oil and canvas. Yeah. So just to remind people who are just started watching. We are we are in the middle of our crowdfunding campaign for our film Derelict, and this is the poster that is being finalized in front of your eyes. And this very poster is available as a perk on our crowdfunding. And I mean this, not not a not a print, not a, not some bullshit like that. This this actual thing, okay? I can see Suzanne is watching, and so I'm gonna go in on there. Look at that. Who is this? Huh? That's you, and that's Mike. Look at that detail. And just to remind you, the sounds watching the level of scale. So that's an inch high brush. So that gives you an idea of the scale. So my fingers, my thumbs. Hi, Suzanne, this is you. Look at that. And Mike. Horrible things happen in there link to this. Look at that. So Jonathan asked for, he wanted their hands to be integrated into the environment. And I knew when I was working, Jonathan was probably thinking, he never said, 
but I wanted it to merge into the into the back into the ground. So what I decided to do because because the arms are behind somebody's back, they're elevated, so they wouldn't be on the ground, integrating into the ground. So I decided to use bramble, uh, things that might uh, contort or wrap around the limbs, just to kind of, just to join it in to the ground, just to make it merge with this environment here. And this is actually, for anybody who's interested in the painting process, this is the fun bit. This is where I've got no reference, I just paint it from my head. I literally get um, Prussian blue, raw umber, you mix it together, you get a, a nice cold brown, if that makes sense. So it's, it's a compromise between brown and blue. And you just paint the, the branches very quickly, and then you put highlights on it, so that's direct. And then you just walk away, and you've got your, you've got your branches. So this is fun. So, so much detail here, so much respect for my reference, for the people's reference. But this is where you can have fun. You can just... You want some blood, you put a little bit of blood. I love that you, that you call it having fun and everybody's like, yeah, I just have no idea how he does that. <laughs> but you're like, ah, this is fun. And everybody else is like, nah. I mean, I've tried to draw hands since I was three and uh, I don't think I've ever managed it even once successfully. Uh, this is, and they, I, I love, I must say, you know, in terms of the, the narrative and all that, what I love is that they... They are colder than the rest of the painting, but at the same time, they feel very much alive. Yes. Because they, there's so much movement in them, and so it's almost like a, almost like a horror poster where they're about to pop out of the, of the ground and grab them, which is exactly kind of, the thing that that the film is about. It's about the presence of of the dead, essentially, and what the dead carry, into people's people's lives, the people that they've left behind. So. It's, uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I'm so pleased with that. And I think people will love it. Um, and again, so if you're watching this and, and you haven't caught up yet, I keep saying this, but this is vital. I would be absolutely gutted if this crowdfunding campaign ended and no one picked this up. Come on. This is worth something, right? This is, this is an actual work of art, you know, and it's available. It's available for grabbing. You can have this, right? And in in 10 years, 20 years, when the film is whatever it is or wherever it is, you'll have that in your house. This is one, one of a kind. Not two, not three, one. What's your preferred subject matter to paint? I love people. Uh, I love painting people. Uh, expression, human expression. Again, you can see, you can... It's like um, we say about art that you can try and keep your secrets, but when you create something, just like when Jonathan wrote the screenplay for Derek, I'm pretty sure you find that a lot more of yourself comes out. So you're secretly telling people about yourself. So I just painted hands, and people might say, that's, that's, that's great, you just paint hands. But it was an opportunity for me to use the human form for expression. So I love painting people. Even at this scale, it, Mike's stance, it's so important that he looks vulnerable. So you just move that knee that little bit forward to put him out of line so he's not, he's not stood. So uh, people, um, dramatic, any scenes with dramatic lighting. I like painting sometimes uh, environments like the corner of a room where you've got shadow, light and shade, and it's just interesting and it brings you in. Um, but I do a lot of different type of work. I, I can... I do animation, I work fluent, I can create fluent cartoon as well. And I say that because people say, well, we all can draw cartoons. I can, I can naturally draw loose cartoon as well, just as easy as I can paint like this, which gives me a lot of flexibility. I think this is it. You have, you have such a wide, um, a wide area of, of what you can do. It's actually quite incredible. Um, because, they, I mean... In a sense, that is very much like the poster for Wyvern Hill, in a way. Not quite stylistically, but in terms of the process and how we work together. And, yes. But you do so, you do so many things. Um, and so if you just call this live, again, this could be in your house, this one. But also, we are adding perks this week to our crowdfunding, where you could get your portrait, your portrait, not mine, not Mark's, not Mike's, not Susan there. Suzanne, sorry. I keep having a hard time with your name, Suzanne. I'm sorry. Your portrait drawn by Mark. 
will be a perk from this week on. And so, you know, you can't miss out on that. Any more questions for Mark? Come on, this is the time. Any questions you have for an artist? We are about to finish it for good. The, the, the liquid is applied. Mark is just looking at it. You have, you have a couple of minutes to ask your questions. Guys, come on, this is a golden opportunity. You don't get to do that every day. Wyvern Hill is among the best posters of the century, according to Jack. Sure. The allure, explosion, and colors all together. I adore your style. Also, would you say Wyvern Hill was harder or derelict? That's a good question, actually. It's, they were, if, if, if I'm allowed to say, they weren't hard. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's because when I'm, when I'm doing these, it's, it's fun for me. I'm actually in the zone. I listen to music. Um, I would say, um, I'd say they're equal, but uh, Wyvern Hill was a lot of reference. So um, Jonathan had given me a lot of material. We, we, Jonathan had specifically asked Pat to send us a side profile picture of her. Um, we had uh, Jonathan sent me little snippets from you know, the edits during shooting. So I had reference material. The most difficult part, if there was, of Wyvern Hill was actually where the brush strokes merge into Pat's hair because that, that can look really wrong. It's very easy to make that look, look um, pathetic. So you style like that actually took stylization to actually make the strokes merge, keep the colors of the composition and not take away from any of the detail around it. So this was a very different painting where there was very little reference material. So I, I got my son to tie me up. <laughs> it sounds a bit odd. Uh, in the studio, uh, my arms just, and took pictures of different lighting, took about 30 pictures, and then said, yes, I like that. Uh, did some sketches, which I sent Jonathan, preliminary sketches. They're actually saved on time lapse as well, so you can see how quickly, just to, and that's not about ca necessarily caption the, the correct anatomy of the hands, it's about caption the correct expression. So I think, I think answer your question, there's, there's more, there was more reference material in Wyvern Hill. This is more an evolution painting. So if you had to say which one was the most difficult, it would probably be this because you're trying to determine, do I make this darker? Do I bring it lighter? Because so many times I, I thought, no, the hands are too bright. I want to, I want to have them respect the light source completely. So they're dark on the left side. And then there's hints of highlight where the sun's setting. And I thought, no, there's a building in front of the sun. No, it's low level, so it wouldn't. And then I thought, no, um, you know, Derelict's going to be shot in colour and in black and white. I want to keep this quite monochromatic, quite black and white. Plus, it, it's got that deaf look, like John said earlier, it gives you that feeling of horror. So, and it almost gives it that ghost-like quality. So this would have been a more difficult um, painting than Wyvern Hill for all those reasons. Which reminds me that the Wyvern Hill canvas is also a perk on our crowdfunding for the same price. It's the same size, I believe. Uh, and it's right now in my bedroom and you can have it in your house. The original painting, again, not a copy. The original painting in your house. This is it, this is it, guys. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we valued the artist in our campaign. That we all are artists, not just Mark, by the way, all are artists, everyone that's involved. We wanted to make sure they're valued, we wanted to make sure they're paid, and that's where this is going. So, you guys, this is exciting. Any more questions? This is your time, this is going to get awkward. Very insightful take, says Jack. So the, um, just as a recap for anybody who's just watching, so both Wyvern Hill posting this are oil and stretch canvas. So there's a wooden frame. I won't turn it around because it's just drying on the surface now, but it's a um, wooden frame, stretch canvas. It comes primed. So there's, there's a, it's primed to protect the canvas, the linen or, you know, from getting damaged by, um, the oils, the oils over time would rot and deteriorate the camp. So it's got a prime on it. And then it's uh, both Wyvern Hill and this painting are built up in layers. 
So you pay the sexy detail, you go away, you come back the next day, you add uh, a mid-tone or a highlight. Um, but a lot of this process is about uh, reveal. So um, I would have painted over this dark, then I get a rag, I trust all clothes, lifesaver, dip it in some white spirit and literally wipe off the dark layer and it reveals the underlayer which is lighter this is how this foliage was created you you paint it roughly then you paint over it and then you decide i'll reveal this i'll reveal this and using my nail or the edge uh, of an old brush you just reveal it and the paint does the rest of the work for you it really does create this um atmosphere this this uh you know feeling of depth I mean, the, this here, this section here, is just loose brush strokes. It's smaller, it's like half an inch brush, and I literally do this to suggest grass, and then glaze over it. And when you walk back from it, your eyes do the rest. It brings it all together. And the, and the, the nice thing about a painting like this is it looks detailed, but if you go up close, it's quite abstract. So you are constantly reminded that this was painted. This is not a, a photographic, you know, a reproduction. This is something that somebody has actually made because uh, you can see brush strokes, you can see scratch marks. And that's something we always discussed, isn't it? Is we never, I mean, we wanted something that was detailed, but at the same time, I wanted it to be clear that it was a painting. I wanted people to be able to see and appreciate the artistry, essentially, um, and, and have it very stylized, um, you know. I think painting rather than going digital was the best route, says Jack. Yes, I think also it's there's an element of respect with a painted poster. I, I, you know, some people think it's nice to have a painted poster, but I think if you take the time to produce something individual um, and not digitally, it does create that element of respect. There's a, there's a lot of workers into this. It's quite a personal each time. I said to Jonathan last night, so is the art of a, the life of an artist. You get an attachment to a painting and then it's gone, you know, and, it's, and that's just the way it is. And then you find something else to work on. So when you invest all that time, and sometimes it was up to two or three in the morning, you know, you just, because when you're in the zone, you don't want to get away from it. So you're enjoying it and you're painting. But when you, when you invest that time in something, you really have to believe why you invest that time in it. And it is not just about money. It's not about money. It's about, I want to represent derelict. I want people to look and think, oh, you know, it's not just a painting and, uh, you know, it's nice. It's about something that if you're going to create, um, you know, this atmosphere by, by spending a lot of time with something, it does show an element of respect. It does. Um, I think sometimes it moves people from others. It, it creates a divide because it's not about, oh, I know an artist. So you're lucky you can have somebody who can do it for you. It's not about that. It's about a lot of people wouldn't bother to take this time to make something so unique. For a project and that that's what i like about painting and yeah and that's exactly the point and although you say it's not about money i i absolutely agree for me money it's only important right now because we're trying to raise this this funding to pay everybody but for me the creation the act of creation is never about money but then at the same time what you're saying is true this is a unique thing there isn't you know whereas a digital thing you can reproduce as many times as you need it to be whereas this is a one-off you're just never going to get another one of these this is it this is a one piece it's unique that's what makes it so valuable and and i get it i know what you're saying that it's not about money and it's not the act of creation is not about money but unfortunately sometimes you need the tools you need the people to create your thing and so this is why we're running our crowdfunding and this is part of it so this could be yours look at this in your house so I can send Jonathan the some extra photographs so you can see a very brief timeline of how it's created. So it's blank canvas at the start, which usually threatens a lot of people. I love it. I sent a picture of the empty canvas to Jonathan when we were deciding, shall we paint the poster? Because we really wanted to, but we were conscious of time. And I just sent a picture of the canvas in the studio and I went, I said to Jonathan, paint me. You <laughs> know, it was just calling. <laughs> so I knew I was going to paint it. There that, that I knew that I just had to do it. So, uh, and then um, I've always, composition's always been quite easy for me. So I don't spend ages rubbing it out. I just build in people and that's it. 
Uh, I don't think Jonathan see that yet, but I'll send it to him. That's no, that's and amazing. Then you then you just work on it. It's it's almost like paint by numbers. Here you, you you fill in the rest, but you you're conscious that whatever you're working on something here, how is it going to affect something here? Whenever I change the color here, will it offset against here? So back it's a back and forth process. I'll sit in the chair sometimes for up to half an hour just staring at it. And when you when you say you go, I need to darken this, I need to lighten this, I need to move that here. And then you just get up and you do it. So <clears throat> there's a lot of technical process for creating a painting as well. But with these sections, it, it is more fun. It's more vibrant. Um, the, the concepts that are available, we don't, you, they, they can be reproduced. Uh, they're watermarked at the moment, you know, for protection. But we have time-lapse videos. So if anybody wanted a time-lapse video along with a signed original concept drawing, you can actually see the process. I think they're each yeah. about five minutes long. And we can we can yeah, certainly give people access to that. That's not a problem. Yeah. And and that I think that's that was John for my our way of making them individual and unique in their own way because you can kind of you can see sometimes where I've I've put something here and then I just wipe it out and then I put something else here. And that way you can see the thought process in the concept. Whereas uh, when you do a painting you've pretty much determined the layout. You're not going to, well, I don't like to paint, start a paint and go into detail and go, oh, I should have moved that building over there. I don't want to do that. This is pretty much sorted before I touch canvas. Where the concepts, you determine composition based on the screenplay, you're deciding on the mood, you're moving things around, maybe two, three, you know, two third ratio, you're trying to get things right. Uh, and then you're it, with loose sketches, you know, lines, you're creating either a harsh atmosphere. So there's a picture of Abigail in the road and she looks quite distressed. And uh, I think the piece is called uh, Broken. And there's a there's there are harsher lines in that in that draw because that's a chance where an artist can just go crazy. And then where the, you've got a picture of Abigail looking out the window in the morning with a cigarette. That's gentler that is a gentler drawn picture so you you use your your technique your process to as much as possible to enhance the emotion to capture the mood to, to help someone just look at an image and go yes i get it i don't know the detail i don't know who they are i don't know what exactly has just happened but i know they're in pain i know they're angry i know they're broken and that's what you do with concept work and like I said, the time lapse will show you that process. Um, so I, I actually have a question for you. I think that's going to interest a lot of people uh, that want to be creative. And sometimes I found it interesting that you said the white canvas can be intimidating to people. I think it's the same with a white page. I think it's the same with a, a camera. I think it's the same with, with pretty much any tool that you have to master before you can get anything done. So what would you say, what, how would you get people that want to be creative and they don't know how to get started? What would you say to them? What would, how would you encourage them to, to, to do something? Because one thing that, that winds me up is people who bang on about talent, 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 talent. Like this is the one thing that you need to be creative, but they don't see the work that you've put in. They just see the talent, which is a thing. You're clearly a talented man, but you've worked hard at your thing. Yes. So what would you say to someone who's trying to be creative and they're starting and but they, they're kind of worried about the blankness of the tools, right? I, th I think what I've, because I just had a conversation with a friend a few weeks ago about this and she wants to get her creative buzz back and she's going through a hard time. And I said to her, um, you have a story to tell. So don't try and be creative just to be creative. Try and use creativity to tell your story. So I think... If somebody wants to produce a piece of work or just have a go at drawing a, a you know doing a watercolor, find the things that really move you, find the things that visually entice you, find the things that make you feel engaged, because that will increase your creativity instantaneously. Because you are so so me, so for example, somebody paints houses and sells the watercolors in the shop, you go, Oh, I wish I could draw a house. And you go, but do you like Houses, buildings in particular. No, I don't. Right. So why would you try and do a watercolor of a house? What do you like? Um, I love, I love, I love my dog. I love the way my dog frowns in the morning when it's still waiting for its food. Right. 
capture that, use that subject, use that subject matter, use that theme, and then think about creating that rather than just creating for the sake of it. The more you do that, the less scary it becomes. Plus, it's a release. It's a psychological release for you because, just like I said earlier, you start telling people a little bit more about yourself through another language. So through visual, rather than using words to tell a story, a little bit of use getting out. That helps you relax more, that releases more of your creativity, and so the story, the journey continues. And I know people say it's a lot easier for me, you know, but like Jonathan said, you know, I, I was drawn from, from an incredibly young age um, because that's what I wanted to do. So my instinct was there, so I never felt threatened by blank canvas because I used to, I can't imagine not doing it. You know, what else would I do? So, but for a lot of people, I think they like the nature of being creative. They like the idea of painting a picture, whether it's for the bucket list. But the truth is they may have something really important to say. That's what you use creativity for. I mean, that's what Joss is doing in Derelict. You know, this story has, has you know, is not about Jonathan, but the way he tells the story, the way he describes certain uh, scenarios, there'll be little pieces of him coming out. Definitely. And, you know, and this is something you cannot escape. It's, it's, this is... Well, this otherwise, is you're just doing something that's, that's a little bit empty, isn't it? That's and the for problem. others. And yeah. that's my problem with people doing a painting of a building because they've seen one in a shop. Oh, I'd like to be able to do that. Yeah, but it doesn't move you. So you are trying to create something to impress somebody else. Why not use your creativity? And, and, and the paradox is that if something moves you, the likeliness is it will move other people as well. Exactly. Because it will be more sincere. It will be more uh, prominent. It will, it will stand out more and you go, I get it. Because they've invested that time to, to squeeze out what they're trying to say. And, and, and it'll be completely obvious, you know. And I think this is what happens with some directors, you know, I'll give them names, but... You know, whether in their, their prime, they really are telling stories about themselves. They, you know, are an experience from their childhood or a story they've always wanted to tell. And then later on, they might, you know, mainstream, they might be producing work because that is what the audience wants. And I don't think you should ever do that. You know, I don't think you should give anything because, they, I mean, people might say this is commission based, but it's not. This is a very personal thing. This is. Something I've discussed with jo uh, Jonathan. This is something I wanted to do. And you don't spend this much time on something if you're not. Because like I said, there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of me in there. Even though Jonathan and I are very specific what detail we have. Like I said earlier, I, I love human expression. I love um, using light and shade to tell a story. You, you just you put yourself in there. I love the fact that. Mike's got a little bend in his right knee because he's vulnerable. Now, some people mightn't see that, but I've secretly let a little bit of me in there. And that's what, that is what creativity is about. Um, it's not, creativity also is not just about judging the aesthetics of something or how technically uh, accomplished something is. That's not what creativity is about. Because if you are producing stuff just for the sake of making it look realistic, you've halfway along the journey lost by the reason you're doing it in the first place because paintings can become quite tiresome there comes a point where you go oh i just wish i could walk away from it now but it needs to and and that is why expression you know get that dog in the morning i'll draw it sketch it the back of an envelope anything just start letting it out and, and creativity will come so that, that brings me to another question and then mike asked a question as well and i'll, I'll ask it but how do you know when it's finished Oh, that's a superb question. Um, who asked that? Me. Oh, you did. Because right. um, I know really, the answer to that. Because, because the truth <laughs> is, it may not ever be finished, but there comes a point where what I usually do is I, I paint it, I think it's done, and I'll leave it for a day. And that's what I did yesterday, John. I leave it for a day. And then I come back and I look at it, and I might go, oh, I just need to do this, need to do that. And um, it's when... How, when, for example, when this one was finished, not necessarily by the level of detail, but just when everything just seems to merge together, the colour, the layout, then you know it's finished. So, for example, Mike mightn't have had much detail around his face, but if it felt that it was... But you do recognise it, though. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's about it's it captured it's, something like it's, immediately. Yeah, it's Mike's um, it's Mike's stance. Mm. I studied his stance, so he sent me pictures. Um, yeah, it's definitely Mike's stance, and um, so yeah, it's a good question. When is it finished? When I suppose when you decided it, you know, because. But so, even then, is it really finished? Because actually, I'm asking because I know this is an infernal question because no, it's the never, same as no, editing. No, you will always come back to something, and to be honest, nine times out of ten, you go, "Oh, you know." I hated it when I was doing it, but it's it's okay. But then you'll always go, yeah, that little bit there, I should have done that. That will always happen, you know, um, because it's it's for that time. And then later on, it's gone. Mm. You, know, you change, you change your mood. You know, in 10 years' time, I might... Think, oh, but I guess it's harder, it's harder for, for a painter, in a sense, because once the painting is out of your hands, you can't really go into somebody's house and go, sorry, I just thought of something, and I'm I'm going to just come and change it. No, but it would be tempted. But I was watching um, Insidious last night with my son, and I was looking at the picture, the painting on my phone, and I went, Joel, can you just give me a minute? And I actually went upstairs, <laughs> mixed some Persian blue and Romber. I'll just show Jonathan. And I just put a little kink here on the arm, a little kink here, because I felt the arm was too cylindrical, and I wanted it just to have that. And nobody else might see that, but I just stood back and go, yeah, that's fine. When clean my breast said, sorry, John, so we continue with Insidious. But that's, we... that's the level of perf perfectionism that makes it valuable as well, though, isn't it? You know, yeah, it thing. is. It becomes very personal. So it's almost like uh, a child. It's not like a child. But it's you build a relationship with something. I've given it to Jonathan now, and I will walk away, and then that's Jonathan is the new parent. You could say it's, it's a weird thing, you know. But also um, it lives with you while you do it, doesn't it? Because yeah, it's it in your house. Yeah, uh, you just said you're watching something with your son and all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, hang on, the painting is calling, you know. Yeah. It, li it literally has a life with you. How long does it live with you once you've delivered it? It goes quite quick. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, it does because you're the custodian now. It's... Um, it's it's part of its journey, you know, and it it does go quite quick. But I still enjoy when the posters come out. I I will enjoy looking at them, and I will be zooming in, um, breaking down the detail again. Just question was that the right thing to do? That will happen for a long time, to be fair. But um, now once I walk away today, um, that little bond is gone. And it's sort of like I said to you last night. It's a, it's a very weird thing because you're right. I've I've pretty much lived in the studio for a week, and I've. You know, you have your teas up there, you sit and you watch and you have a look at it and then you do a little bit. And you, it becomes, in a sad way, a little bit like your friend for a while because it's, it's invested all your time, all your thinking. Uh, you see something on television and somebody reaches for something with a hand and you say, oh, hands, hands, because you're thinking of hands all the time. You know, you start, you know, you, the, the subject that you're representing takes over. And that happens a lot. I was I did a painting a few months ago with uh, floating plastic for weeks after, whenever the shopping came and there was a crease in the plastic, you're, it's bringing back that flash of doing the painting and how much you were studying things. I, I sat in the garden the other day and had a cup of tea and just had a look at the grass. Um, you know, it was actually the peg basket was in the garden. I'm just seeing how the grass caked over it. So you're constantly using um, sources you know, and once the painting goes, a few weeks later, you switch off from looking at hands, but the painting's gone today, you know, and it, yeah, it is very much a part of you. Um, Mike's asked a question, what is it like working with me? And then I'll ask you another question. So I'll ask those two questions at the same time. What is it like working with me from Mike? And the other thing is, do you, because I think that's important for creatives, especially people who are a little bit anxious about creation, right? You're a very accomplished artist. Do you still learn things? Yes. Always learn. You always learn. It, it, when, I, when I've been too proverbial, you hear that the more you know about a subject, the more you realise you don't know about it. I mean, masters, they were Renaissance masters where Titian painted a curtain hundreds of years ago with, that uh, was purple, and everybody was amazed. We don't have purple pigment. We don't, we kind of... And he didn't know how he did it. He he painted, I think, I think it was blue first. Or was it blue? So he painted blue, the curtain of blue, and then he washed a semi-transparent red glaze out over it, and the blue came through the red, and he had purple. So so art masters knew so much more about painting 
hundreds of years ago. That's a fact now, and a lot of that has been forgotten because we're in a digital age, people are always in a rush. So my point is, my whole, my life, I will always learn, you know. I, this was a bit of a learning process because, you know, this is one of the few paintings I've done where you've got three different styles of painting. Like I said, this is really, this. most of this was painted with a, a three-inch uh, paintbrush from B&Q. So you, you paint your colours and then you, you blend it in and you let the glaze take over. So you, you're always learning, you know, to be able to just paint a branch, you know, out of your head. You think, oh, I didn't realise we could do that. You know, so you're, you're constantly learning. So you're storing images in your head all the time. So, yeah, absolutely. I think I think for people like yourself, Jonathan, as well, if there came a day where you stop learning, it might actually get boring. Yeah, no, it, it totally is that, you know, and I try to design every film I make as a learning opportunity, you know, and you, you set yourself some, some challenges, not challenges that might get in the way of your success, but challenges that, that will push you, you know what I mean? So, for example, I wouldn't set myself the challenge of, doing Lord of the Rings on £5,000. I know I can't do that. But, for example, on um, on Derelict, the narrative, the way we shattered the narrative, the way we destructured the narrative, and this, this drama aspect, that's something that's going to push us, you know, and, and we want to push. You want to push because that's when you yeah. learn. Um, and learning, yeah, if you stop learning, I think that's that's creative death, essentially, when you've got nothing to... Or when you feel you have nothing to learn. Because actually there's always something to learn. Always, you know, um, it's it's. I think, I think if you're prepared to learn, you keep your mind open. If you keep your mind open, you're going to be more creative. And also, just in yes. terms, you know, when you look at paintings or you look at cinema, you know, which actually have very kind of similar things, you know. And the more you were talking about this, the more I was thinking, this sounds like editing, and this sounds like this, and this sounds like that. But the thing is, there are so many stylistic options, including maybe stylistic options that nobody's found yet. So you can always find new things or take inspiration in new things and learn new things. Yes. And I think, you know, that's that's the thing. But this is what's really interesting in that is that I've never seen this before. It's something new. But the techniques that you use are centuries old. Yes. Yes. And yeah. so you've basically built something new out of something that existed for how many? How many? Hundred, five, six hundred years ago. So, um I painted directly for years, so on the, on what that means is, if I was, it would it would be a quicker process, but it's a flatter uh, result. So you'd paint the bricks, and as you paint the bricks, you paint them that dark, and as you paint the photos, zoom on the you bricks, paint that's that dark. quite impressive. Yeah. So what what this process is that um, the glazing process is, you paint the building first and the foliage, and then you put a layer. Where you see, so decide the light source is coming from the right, which it is. The sun setting on the right, so the shade is going to be on the left. So you must obey the the, the lighting source, apart from that. And then, I literally I can't touch you, but I got it right. You paint it, and then you just wipe out to reveal the under layer. So this is what you know Renaissance painters were doing hundreds of years ago, you know. And this was they learned this from trial and error. Now the the secret of doing gla uh, glazing is. You must have a very good awareness of colour because if you apply um, up to 10 layers of a semi-transparent glaze in something, you can totally destroy the colour. So you have to be able to know in advance how it's going to look after you put that 10th layer on. And that's why a lot of people would find glazing very difficult. Okay, so if there are no more questions... I think we'll leave it to that. I will just remind you one last time, if you're watching this, whether it's live or if you're watching it later, this painting is in our perks for £3,000. You also get producer perks at that price. So it would be awesome to have you on board. This is a unique piece. There is one in the world of this. It's based on amazing techniques of, of painting. Mark's been working endlessly towards this, and it can be in your house right now. Have you ever had to make a compromise on a project, and how has that affected your attachment to that project? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, think, I think what I say to some people is, if you tell me what I can't do, 
I find that more freeing than if you told me I can do everything. So there's always an element of compromise. There's, you know, you, especially if you're working for people, you have to satisfy them. So say somebody wanted a, a few people have asked for commissions in the past, but they don't really do commissions just of, of, of can you do a portrait of my parents? Yes, yes. Uh, and they, they produce this picture where they're in their Sunday best or they're at a wedding and they're just staring at the camera. And that's fine for a picture, but that's not good enough for uh, a painting. A painting should have a level of narrative of storytelling. So you have to go back to them and you have to say, you know, I can do it, but I'm not going to enjoy it. It's going to be quite flat. And to be honest, you've got a photograph. What would be more interesting would be a picture of your parents or your dad's maybe reading the paper and your mum's stroking the cat, you know, that tells you a little bit about their lifestyle. Uh, so sometimes you have to compromise and things like that. But generally, uh, there isn't much level of compromise because like when Jonathan and I worked on this before, when we first discussed the poster and the concepts, similar to when we would discuss Wyvern Hill, Jonathan's very specific about what he wants, but it's my opportunity then to throw in ideas and say, what about this and what about that? So before you go down this as far as this, you've got over those hurdles. So um, fortunately, Jonathan and I, see, we, I think we do think visually quite similar. Yeah, I think so. I think like when we discuss concepts, it's like when we decided what concepts would we have for Derek, we pretty much had the same list. You I know? think that you, you, yeah. you, make, you make a good point, and then I'm sure you feel that in painting is that I think there is that, that notion, that modern notion that uh, art needs to be a vector of reality, like it has to reproduce reality somehow. Like I, I, I you know, it's impressive when you see a painter that can paint photorealistically something that they can look at a picture and then paint it absolutely photorealistically. You couldn't make, take the, tell the difference between that and the photo. Technically, it's always impressive. But I always find that it kind of defeats the object of, of painting, right, for me. And I feel the same for film. Like, I, don't, I don't think film has necessarily a duty towards reality. How do you feel about that? You ask me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that um I think the the element of reproduction is boring. Um you the so you need to transcribe. I think that's what film and art is about. It's a transcription of what you see and what you feel. If you are just reproducing something for the sake of it, you're just creating another print of it, another copy. So I think film and art have to have that level of freedom where it's not just about a reproduction, a detailed reproduction of what is in front of you. Because I think when a lot of people are aspiring to paint, that is their goal. I mean, I was, I don't know if I can say, I was painting for the real from a very young age. So for me, I, I never got the buzz out of anything which some people aim for, you know. So, but storytelling was always my thing. And just like you said, Jonathan, you, you're perfectly right. You do have to remove certain details and that to ensure that you are telling the story correctly and it isn't just about representation. If, mm. if this was super detailed and the people said, that's amazing, I can't believe the detail, Mike's head's so small, but yet he's so, I can see the wrinkles under his eyes. Not that saying you have some, Mike. You're a young boy. <laughs> You're a young boy. It's just an example. But the thing is, the, you might think that's great from a technical point of view, but it would totally knock the conversation because why is he so focused? But and also, also you've system. captured his essence. Like I look at this, and I, I, and, I, and Mike's one of my best friends, so I, I, I can tell it's Mike from a mile away, you know. And you've captured, you've captured the Mikeness, which is, which is what you want. I don't care that it realistically, photo, photo realistically looks like Mike. I care that you've captured something, that you've captured the essence of something. Because here's, here's the thing for me that's always been about art, any art, right? Whether it's music or whether it's painting or, or, or film or whatever. And this is the reason why context is so important in understanding film and painting and art, is that we actually use them to decipher reality, not to represent reality, yes. right? We take them and then we assimilate them to, under to understand our own reality better, our own context better. And we leave a trace, which means that in 20, 30 years, people can look at it, look at the context that we're living in and, and understand the reality we're living in, not because it looks realistic, 
but because the way that you've created it makes sense in the context of what we were creating and it helps understanding what we were creating. Yes, I totally agree. And that, that is why uh, on a project like this, you spend a lot of time, you invest a lot of time with the screenplay, uh, you speak to the director, the producer, you want to find as much as you can. Yes, I, I will ask Jonathan about I see Abigail as quite um, defined features, you know, and Jonathan pretty much using the same. And, and you, so you want a level of, of visual uh, representation, just a little to use when you're doing concepts and that, so you capture the essence of a person. But also, it's about what, what they're about, what their soul is. It's about um, how they would react to a scenario, and then you use that to tell your story. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think this is what's yeah. striking with, with... I mean, the thing is, I know Mike particularly well, so this is, this is why. But I think you, you've... Yeah, it's like you've captured his soul. You've captured his likeness. It's not... Oh, yeah, it looks exactly like my detail per detail. Look at the pores on his skin. That's exactly Mike. No, but... When you look at it, you can tell it's Mike. You've captured something of him. And the hands are the same. You've captured the theme. You've captured the, the idea behind it. You've captured what they mean. Um, and I think, I think that's art. For me, that's art. So there you go. On that note, I think we can leave people alone. One last reminder that this is available in... Our crowdfunding campaign. Come on, guys. This can't. You can't pass this. This is. This is. Look at this. Look at this. It's. It's stunning. And we have another one of these. So we have two paintings going in this campaign. Now there isn't that many crowdfunding campaigns that do things like this. We've created this whole new original work, which is going to turn into our film poster, and it's available for you. And yes, it's pricey, and I understand times are hard for everybody. But if you do have this kind of money, this is this is something that you won't find twice. This is a once. This is a one chance opportunity. So thank you very much, guys, for watching. Uh, we'll say goodbye to Mark, and thank you. Goodbye, thank you. And we'll do another live soon.